Um, so we have now a short session with two speakers and one uh, greetings. So the first speaker is uh, Stephen Franker from Tentium. Uh, no so I want to talk to you today about some work we've been doing on pulse level variational quantum algorithms, uh, initial applications to superconducting qubits and quantum chemistry. And when I say our work, I really mean my student, Declan Merom's work. And uh, fortunately, because of the uh, sponsorship of the conference, uh, Declan's here with us today in the front row. So uh, I'm going to bring him in later on if we have some interesting questions and discussion. Um, the project is uh, part of a larger funded uh, uh, research proposal with uh, my colleagues at the Weizmann Institute, Roy Ozeri and Serge Rosenblum, who's here today, I think. And uh, it's funded by the Israel Science Foundation, so we're grateful to them for the support. Um, oops. So um, any quantum algorithm talk has to begin with the word NISC, right? So NISC is noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. And that implies two things. It implies relatively few qubits, so on the order of tens or hundreds of qubits. Uh, and they're noisy. And by noisy, we mean uh, they experience uh, relaxation, dephasing, decoherence. Uh, state preparation and measurement errors, as well as gate errors. And uh, the implications of this practically from, with regard to building circuits for quantum algorithms is that the circuit needs to be um, relatively short in terms of its width, the number of qubits that are available, obviously, and also in terms of its depth. Because the longer the depth, the more errors creep in, and the calculation will not uh, converge. So to deal with this challenge, uh, the community has come up with this idea of hybrid quantum classical computing, where we use the quantum computer in its limited state to do what it does best, and we uh, supplement that with a classical computer and use it to couple together and hopefully get some useful results. The flagship algorithm in this hybrid space is the so-called variational quantum algorithm, or VQA, and this is a general schematic. Um, and to help you remember the details of this, I came up with an acronym. AMCO, which stands for ANSATS, Measure, Cost, and Optimize. So the quantum computer handles the first two of, those acronym, of that acronym, and the classical computer handles the second two. So this is a schematic that DECO prepared, where the quantum computer is over here. We prepare a, um, an ANSATS, a trial solution for our problem, uh, typically in the form of parameterized quantum circuit. And uh, then we make a series of measurements. and. Uh, we hand off to the classical computer where we compute a cost function uh, based on some uh, operator which is related to the uh, problem that we're trying to solve. And uh, then we uh, try to minimize or optimize that uh, cost function by a classical computer using something like gradient descent to update the parameter vector theta, then reinitialize the uh, ansatz and repeat the calculation until convergence. So that's the general idea. And today what we're going to do is, is mess with the ansatz, OK? So the blue region is really where we're going to be making some changes, as you'll see. The algorithm is not very old, but it's been widely used in a number of different application areas. Uh, for example, uh, in machine learning with quantum neural networks, um, in combinatorial optimization with uh, QAOA, variational quantum linear solvers to solve systems of linear algebraic equations, which uh, is near and dear to my heart and the quantum, uh, variational quantum eigensolver, or VQE, which is to predict ground states of molecules and condensed matter physics. And the uh, VQE is going to be the focus of our application today. So with regard to the ansatz, it's really the key to the whole algorithm, the success or failure of the algorithm. As I mentioned, it takes the form of a parameterized quantum circuit. The main parameters in this circuit are the gates, and the gate angles, basically, I should say. Um, and uh, there are two main classes or two main categories of these ansatz. The first one is what's called a problem-inspired ansatz. And as the name suggests, it's constructed based on the physics of the problem that you're trying to solve. So for example, in the context of chemistry, we have the uh, unitary coupled cluster, uh, which is a typical classical ansatz that's been used for chemistry. But for other problems, it could take a different form. The advantage of this, or the features of this, is that it's problem-specific. So the search space is relatively small, and that increases the chances that you'll be able to get a solution. But it usually translates into a very large circuit depth, which is disadvantageous with regard to uh, decoherence and, and, and gate errors. The second um, ansatz is the so-called hardware-efficient ansatz. 
And as the name suggests, this is uh, an ansatz that's built up from gates that are native to the hardware. So it's not problem specific. It's sort of one size fits all. Um, and it usually takes the form of successive layers of single qubit rotations followed by uh, generic entangling gates. And this is repeated as many layers as you want. Of course, the more layers you have, the more depth you have in the circuit and the more decoherence and errors that you encounter. Uh, it also, because it's not tied to the problem, it has a relatively large search space. And this could be problematic when it comes to trainability. Um, but it can be, the circuit depth can be controlled, and, and that's one of its uh, attractive features. So again, what we're targeting here today is more related to the hardware efficient ansatz. Again, the goal here is to minimize circuit depth and maximize accuracy, obviously. And again, the gate angles, this parameter vector theta that shows up uh, in these ansatz are the parameters that are to be optimized. That's the state of the art in this approach. Now, one of the problems that it encounters uh, is something called the Barron Plateau problem, which if you've been reading the literature, you're probably familiar with this. These are two-dimensional cross-sections of cost function landscapes from a global cost function and a local cost function uh, with four qubits in blue and then 24 qubits in orange. And what you see here on the left is this phenomena of vanishing gradients, which increase exponentially as the number of qubits increase, which makes it very difficult to use a gradient-based uh, optimizer to know which way you're supposed to go to find your solution. The local cost function seems to be able to handle it better for this particular problem, but this is a, an issue that plagues all uh, parameterized quantum circuits, which are used as ansatz in VQA. And there's a lot of activity on this problem. There's, here's four of the biggest papers, I think, in the last uh, you know, year or two that you can check out to learn more about this. And, and again, it has to do with how expressive the ansatz is, whether it's a global or local cost function, uh, how much entanglement there is, uh, noise. People are still debating what are the main causes of this, but it's definitely a challenge, and it makes the problem difficult to, to train. Another couple facts before we get to our main point here is, as we're well aware here, I think, in this audience, uh, with regard to superconducting qubits, um, the superconducting qubits are controlled, so gate operations are implemented, if you will, by microwave pulses applied through the readout resonators, the control and readout resonators of each of the qubits. And um, that's something to be aware of. This is a process where we know that uh, when we program at the gate level, which is an abstraction, um, and we create a quantum circuit, uh, these have to be transpiled and compiled down to the pulse level. And so gates at the circuit level, which is the software level that we usually program in, are implemented as pulses at the hardware level. So these are facts that are well known, but when you put this all together, it starts to get you thinking about some other approaches. Uh, the last slide related to that is um, the issue of quantum optimal control. So when you're designing these uh, pulses, Typically, what's done in quantum optical control is you're trying to optimize a parameterized pulse to achieve a target state or implement a gate with a certain level of fidelity, right? So quantum optimal control optimizes parameterized pulses at the qubit level, whereas we just learned VQA optimizes parameterized gates at the circuit level. So if you think about this for a few minutes, you, you come to an interesting uh, conclusion or idea and that's the hypothesis or the, the idea that we're pursuing in this study. What if the VQAs optimize parameterized pulses directly rather than parameterized gates as part of the overall cost function minimization process, basically bypassing gates almost entirely? I mean, the word gate itself already has a, an, a connotation of being in the way, right? So we can want to get rid of the gates in that case. So we would replace something like this with something like this, where instead of a parameterized quantum circuit based on gates, it would be a parameterized quantum circuit based on pulses directly, and those would be optimized through the overall VQA optimization procedure. We're going to apply this idea, and I'll get into more details of how we do it in just a minute, to uh, VQE, which was the original VQA. Um, and the application is to quantum chemistry. Um, and VQE, if you know anything about this, it uses a variational principle. Uh, that's where the name comes from, to compute the ground state energy of a molecule. And it basically solves an eigenvalue problem defined by the time-independent Schrodinger equation based on the so-called electronic structure Hamiltonian, denoted here h hat. And so here's the uh, eigenvalue problem that we're trying to solve to find the minimum uh, energy here, which would be corresponding to the ground state according to the variational principle. Um, and the electronic structure Hamiltonian 
uh, can be expressed as weighted sums of fermionic creation and annihilation operators, um, where the weight coefficients are related to the one and two electron integrals. And uh, this then can be mapped through the jordan wigner transformation to uh, spin operators, to qubit operators, uh, and turn, turn the electronic structure Hamiltonian into a weighted sum of Pauli uh, strings. And that's effectively what we, what we do when we set up this problem. Uh, this was first presented in a paper in 2014 by Perizoi et al. And uh, it was followed up by another very important paper by O'Malley. And then Condola et al. in 2017 had the first implementation of VQE on a hardware efficient ONSATS. And that really opened the, the game up for everybody and anybody to, to apply this algorithm. And these are, this is the picture, uh, probably the most famous picture that comes from the paper showing the ground state energy versus the interatomic distance. Um, for several different molecules showing the uh, VQE predictions versus uh, the exact solution, so to speak, based on the full configuration inter inter interaction model. So we're going to see this picture a lot in the next uh, part of the talk. OK, so let's set the stage here. This is the VQE algorithm, which is a little bit more specific than the VQA uh, in the context of what the uh, Hamiltonian and the cost function look like. But otherwise, it looks, generally speaking, like a VQA. And um, in the interest of uh, introducing new terminology into the already acronym-rich field of quantum computing, we're going to call a gate-level ONSATS a GONSATS. OK? And I want to see that stick. So everybody, you tell two friends, you tell two friends, and it'll keep going. But that's, uh, that's what we're effectively drawing here. Here is the gate-based ONSATS or GONSATS approach. Now, we're just going to simply keep your eye on this blue box. We're going to simply switch from the Gansatz to a Pansatz, or if you're from New York, a Pansatz, OK? Um, and this is a pulse level Ansatz, OK? Um, and of course, then instead of AMCO, we have POMCO and GAMCO, and just goes on and on. Uh, but you can see here, basically, all we've done is replace the gate level Ansatz, where we had parameterized gate angles, with a pulse based on SOTS where the parameters are up to us to choose. And we'll get into the details of that in just a minute. So this is the minute right here. So this is how uh, Dekel built his PONSATS, his structured PONSATS here. And uh, there are four different steps, if you will, in the construction of the PONSATS. First, we have our hyperparameters. These are things that we fix ahead of time, a priori, like in machine learning, before we enter into the uh, optimization loop. And that includes the pulse shape the amplitude and the frequency of the pulses, and other parameters that we might want to specify. So with regard to the pulse shape, uh, let me show you what the pulse menu looks like. So for our appetizer today, we have a delicious drag pulse. And this is highly recommended, especially if we want to avoid leakage. And during the meal, that could be a problem, OK? Then we move on to the main course, which is a long, smooth, flat top pulse. And this is really good if you enjoy entangling or sharing your food with your Neighbor, yeah, you're going to stop me right in the middle of this joke. Go ahead. OK, that's fine, whatever. Um, and then we can finish up dessert with your delicious, smooth Gaussian pulse. Goes down very smoothly. And then we also have a children's menu with a square pulse for those with simpler palates. OK? Yes? Is it the pulse then that can be straight back to a gate, or there is a Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They're, they're inspired, perhaps, by gates, but they're optimized as part of the process, and they're not, you know, you'll see more details in just a minute. OK, back to the uh, uh, structure. OK, so that's the hyperparameters. So we fix the shape, we fix the amplitude, and we fix the frequency. What do we vary? What's our optimization parameter? Pulse duration. So there's a, th a new theta vector, which is tied to the durations of these pulses. So to be specific, uh, here's an illustration with four qubits. We uh, next move on here. We have a first layer where we apply uh, a pulse, which looks like a drag pulse here, to the two control qubits that are going to be used in the next layer for the two qubit operations. Uh, and this is designed to give us fast entanglement for the, for the qubits. And then we have a repeated series of L layers, as many as you would like, um, which feature two qubit pulses. Uh, as well as single qubit RZ gates, which are virtual gates. So those are parameterized by their angle, their zero duration. Uh, and then finally, a layer of single qubit pulses applied to uh, all the qubits. Okay, so this is the structure of the Ponsatz that we, uh, that Deckel came up with in, as a part of his research. Okay, 
So why is this helpful? At least initially, you can, we'll see the results in a few minutes, but the advantage of, one of the advantages of parameterized pulses is I mentioned earlier that at the gate level, these gates are transpiled and compiled down to pulses. So there's multiple steps that you have to go through, and each of those uh, introduce a certain amount of noise. So for example, if you want to implement a pi over 4 uh, rotation around the x-axis on the block sphere, at the pulse level, there's always a pulse that we can find that'll take us from the uh, ground state to the target state. Okay. Um, but at the gate level, if we want to do that same operation, we have to go through a, a series of gates, basically traveling all around the block sphere to get to our uh, target state, and this introduces a significant amount of noise and latency into the, into the circuit. So we hope with faster evolution, using pulse level control, we'll have shorter duration and less noise. Okay? And we're not the first ones to, to do this, unfortunately or fortunately. Um, there was a very nice paper in 2021 called Gate-Free State Preparation for Fast Variational Quantum Eigensolver Simulations. Uh, very similar philosophy. They parameterized their pulses differently. They had many more parameters. Uh, they didn't have any two-qubit pulses. And they had, even for a two-qubit problem, thousands of function evaluations to converge and significant leakage. So uh, that was an observation we saw in the paper. And they only did simulations. There was no hardware. And then, of course, as is bound to happen on the archive, uh, about a month ago, there was a paper that came out called PAN, Pulse Ansatz on NISC Machines, by a stellar group of universities collaborating together. And uh, they parameterized also differently. They chose amplitude and frequency, and they fixed duration. Too bad for them. Um, and they tested in both simulation and limited hardware runs. So we'll be comparing to both of these results later on. But I have a question for you. Did anybody check the archive this morning? Come on, put your hands up. Don't be shy. OK, do you, do you check the archive every day when you wake up? Serge, tell me the truth. I know Adid does. She's not raising her hand. but sure. she, Yeah, OK, so I'm proposing a new organization here today called AA, Archivers Anonymous. <laughs> this guy just lost his drink. Um, but uh, I think we need it, because I'm checking it even before my coffee. It's not good. It makes me nervous. It stresses me out. OK, let's continue. So here's the overall algorithm that we've implemented. Uh, of course, we've coded in Qiskit, Python, using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we start by building the problem parameters using Qiskit Nature. Uh, then we define the parameterized PONSATs. We choose our hyperparameters. Uh, we choose our initial parameters for setting up the hartree fock state, which is a typical initial state for these types of calculations. Then we build our PONSATs, and there's a little bit of a code snippet from there. Take a picture, zoom in, and you'll have it too. Um, and then we choose we want to do simulation or hardware. On the simulation side, we use Kiska Dynamics, and we're using JAX, which is uh, Google's souped-up NumPy on the GPU. It's amazing, so we're, we're very happy with that because I bought GPUs and I need to use them. And then we also run on the hardware using Kiska's Open Pulse, which is really really enabled this whole field to, to develop. And then we calculate the energy, we optimize the pulse parameters, uh, and then we check for convergence and repeat. OK. You ready for the results? OK. So we'll talk about the results now. Again, this is our, our sanity check plot for the state of the art from 2017. Uh, the simulations were run on the uh, A100s in our lab. And um, we're looking at atoms, obviously. So before we start, I got to ask, do you know why no one trusts atoms? Adi, any? Nothing? Serge? Nothing? Because they make up everything. <laughs> that would be better with an American audience, I'm guessing. But all right, fine. We're, we're too international here. It's, uh, OK. All right, so here's our first result from simulation. This is the ground state energy uh, for the hydrogen molecule. Uh, we've got energy in Hartree versus atomic distance in angstrom. The blue curve corresponds to the FCI. That's the full configuration interaction, the exact solution. Um, and the red dots are the Ponsatz results. And they're, they're spot on uh, with the FCI. So that's good. Fine. Um, and how do we do compared to the other approaches that I mentioned? So here's our curve again sort of zoomed out to match at least one of these two pictures in terms of the aspect ratio. Here's the control VQE, also spot on. The PAN approach, which is a pulse-based approach like ours, they have a discrepancy uh, at larger interatomic distances. Um, and presumably, that's because um, they, they don't have enough entanglement in their, in their pulses. So uh, keep an eye on that discrepancy. We'll see that. We'll come back to that uh, in just a minute. Now, the important result 
besides getting being accurate, is this plot here, which is circuit duration comparisons. So this is the same calculations for all the different atomic distances, but this is the circuit duration. So we've got on here uh, the Gansatz approach, which is just north of 350 nanoseconds. Uh, then we come into a couple of the PON results with single and two qubit native pulses that they used. And um, you can see the green one here is PON with just a single native pulse, which gives them their best duration, about 60, 70 nanoseconds. Uh, and ours is down here, which is south of 50 nanoseconds. But as the uh, interatomic distances increase, our duration goes up and is worse duration-wise than PAN, but our accuracy is better. So with the du duration being dynamic, it can adjust. And if we need more uh, entanglement, then we can get it. It's, it's a nice finding. Yes? Does the duration go per iteration, right? Uh, deco, per iteration? Of the onsets, right, right, right. OK? All right, so that's result number one. Result number two is the first molecule in the universe, helium hydride. Um, and uh, we're showing, again, the same plot. Uh, here's our Ponsatz result versus the FCI. Here's the control VQE. Um, oh, there is Pan. Where's Pan? There he is. Uh, all three of them give good results for this molecule. It's uh, not that challenging, I guess, uh, to compute. So uh, that's fine. The durations are shown here. Uh, Gansatz is up again, north of 350. Pan is 200 and we're down below 50. So the implication here is that we can run longer circuits without, yes? Yeah, there was a question, what about the duration of the training, or how do you, so how long does it take to arrive? You mean how many iterations to convergence? For example. Yeah, yeah, I have a plot for that. Not very many, on the order of tens, yeah. tens? For simpler problems, for like tens maybe, not hundreds or thousands, for sure. I'll show you a plot if you want later on, OK? How, how many qubits are you using? This is two qubits, I believe, yeah. How many parameters? Um, I'll show you the I'll show you the pulse plot later, but huh? yeah, for two qubits, uh, we have five parts. In the inter we just take four and not five parameters, right? Yeah, for the two qubit one, I mean, it's not much more than that. Five, right? Right. And we don't have five because we get rid of the small sets of like those lines. Right? It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, but it's for that, but if the bulk that goes of some, you say it's to be eliminated? Not that we can know of. Okay. Um, so now we move to a, a larger molecule, LIH. Um, and um, this one actually was a little bit challenging for uh, the original VQE paper from 2017. And here is our result here. This is, again, simulation. And you can see down here, we're getting a little bit of a discrepancy. And that's because we only have one layer. So this is our first try at it. We can add more layers because we have plenty of pulse duration to go before we uh, you know, approach the, the gate level. And so we can definitely improve that with more layers. In terms of the pan, this was their only hardware result in the paper. And uh, this is their result for this 1.5 distance. And you can clearly see uh, ours is more accurate in this case. So pulse duration, again, seems to be a, right, a good choice here. Um, and then in terms of, again, duration, you know, the same plot for the Gansatz. Uh, the, the pan result on real hardware is, again, around 200 nanoseconds, and we're down by 50 uh, for all interatomic distances. Okay, now real hardware, right? So that's the next step here. And um, what we've done here is uh, we've utilized the IBM Lagos machine, which uh, seems to have good T1 and T2 times. It's private, relatively private, I guess. So there's a shorter queue. Um, and this is the uh, connectivity. And these are the qubits that we use for the two qubit problem. So let's see what we did with the hardware. So this is the same uh, hydrogen molecule, same type of plot. But now we have um, the real hardware results with the Ponsatz in the orange. And you can see it's, it's also very good agreement with the FCI. But then what Deckel did recently was use uh, implement readout error mitigation, which is standard available in Qiskit to improve uh, the readout accuracy of your results. And you can see the results go from the orange down to the red, basically giving us chemical accuracy uh, for almost all of the interatomic distances. So this is on real hardware. And it's one plot, but it takes weeks to generate. You, know, you have to generate all these curves. You have to wait in the queue. It's, it's, it's not a. Uh, a short uh, process. And these are the pulse durations on the real hardware. Uh, again, same type of comparisons that we made before. 
And again, you can see uh, our case is real hardware. Most of these are all simulation results. But on the real hardware, you can see, again, we're very good pulse duration at close distances. And then dynamically, it goes up. But that's the advantage of dynamic duration, is that we can get good accuracy even at those larger interatomic distances. And this is a plot. I just got it uh, 2 in the morning from Deckel. He was up late last night. I got it this morning. He was up at 2 in the morning. Because I asked him, I wanted to visualize, see what's happening, because it's like a black box. So uh, I didn't have time to really digest this. But this is uh, how it started. This is the initial uh, pulse parameter uh, description. And then this is how it's going. This is at the end of the calculation. You can see the, the two qubits and the pulses and the uh, duration time here. This is for the d equals 0.7 case. So 0.7 is over here. It's, it's around, uh, I guess, well, I don't know. It says 48, 48 seconds here. Yeah, so it's uh, just to give you an idea for how that uh, looks. OK, so what we've done here is we've uh, developed a parameterized pulse-based onsots, which we call PONSOTS. And we'd like you to call it PONSOTS2, please. Um, and it's based on pulse duration. It's not the only choice, obviously, but it's the choice that, that Deckel chose wisely, I think, in his initial uh, uh, investigation. We tested it both on simulation and on hardware. And that wasn't for sure before we got to this conference. It takes time to get the hardware results. And we didn't know how they were going to come out. So we're very happy with that. These are the two pictures I just showed you on that. Uh, we got improvements in both accuracy and efficiency, which in my world of computations is usually opposed, right? You get one for the other. But here we get both. Um, we saw significant latency reductions. And again, it depends on the entanglement level required for your problem. So it's kind of dynamic in that sense. And this potentially enables simulations of larger molecules with more layers. So that is what we're working on right now. So the bottom line message is to pulsify your onsots, OK? No more gates. Well, I'm going to be careful there. Um, OK, what's next? So we're continuing hardware runs. We're extending to larger molecules. Beryllium hydride is, is next on the list. And then we're looking at other VQAs. So we're particularly interested in VQLS because of the potential applications for solving partial differential equations. Um, so we're working on that now. And then QAOA is a little bit different because it has a cost function Hamiltonian uh, and a mixer Hamiltonian. And, and the problem solution is embedded into the cost. So it's like a problem inspired and a hardware inspired. So we think maybe a Hansatz a hybrid gate pulse on, she said, no more of these acronyms. But that's, that's what we think could be done. And then we also think that quantum error mitigation, uh, particularly zero noise extrapolation, uh, because it uses stretched pulses, would be a natural fit in our pulse-based onsats approach. Thank you very much.